July 7, 2025. At exactly 2.25 p.m., a Ukrainian MiG-29 fighter jet is preparing for an attack operation. Two GBU-62 JDAM bombs weighing a total of more than 900 kilograms are in the process of being integrated to accompany the jet. While planning the target tactical chart, a brief risk-benefit session was held at the operations center. During this session, intelligence officers emphasized that Russian electronic warfare intensity had increased by 18% over the past 24 hours, but that spare part shortages observed during the Book M2 maintenance cycle had reduced the number of ready-to-fire missiles on the ramp. Recognizing that the threat was not absolute but variable, planners sought to seize the narrow window of opportunity, that is, to launch the strike during the brief period when Russian batteries were undergoing heat control tests. The target was a steel-reinforced concrete arch bridge over the Karachakrak River, which had been reinforced by Russian troops three months earlier. But this bridge was no ordinary crossing. It was a critical point in the supply lines to Zaporizhia, Melitopol, and Crimea. Field logistics experts described the bridge's capacity as a narrow bottleneck that consolidated 1,200 tons of fuel and ammunition at a single point each day. Just one day earlier, the Russian 70th Motorized Infantry Brigade had established an advanced attack line around Zaporizhia, deploying two battalions of infantry south of the river line. Two howitzer batteries, armored convoys, and fuel convoys were to cross the bridge. But 15 minutes later, a 900-kilogram load would dive onto this bridge from a height of 11,000 meters. A single daring sortie, two launches, and a massive explosion. The most critical bridge in the region would be engulfed in flames for the Russian army. Before diving into this critical operation, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like our videos, and turn on notifications. The MiG-29 jet was preparing for the challenging mission. Russian Buk M2 and Tor batteries were scanning the area around the Dnipro River. To overcome this, they needed to release the bombs from the optimal distance and altitude. When launched from 11,000 meters, the JDAM ER bombs had a range of 74 kilometers. But at medium altitude, the bombs had to be launched from a closer distance to counter Russian air defense systems. While analyzing the density of the defense line, the electronic intelligence cell detected that the Tor batteries left a 5-second antenna calibration gap before engaging. The mission profile was adjusted so that the bomb would be released precisely during this gap. This meant that by the time the radar gave its first response, the bomb would already have entered its ballistic glide phase. Weapons technicians used forklifts to pull the 454-kilogram JDAM ERs from the supply route and connect them to the MiG-29 station. After inserting the electronic cutoff pin, the technicians confirmed that the DSU-43 tail fuse module was seated correctly. They then connected the G-coded navigation link cable to the aircraft's main weapons computer. The ground crew preparing the bombs used NATO-type full protection visors instead of the standard helmet-mounted goggles. Now, double data verification is performed for each bomb, which extends the hangar time by 12 minutes, but maintains the zero-firing error policy in the field. This cable acts as an intermediary in loading the target coordinates onto the bomb, eliminating the need for an external data link on the aircraft prior to firing. Once the JDAMs were integrated into the MiG-29s, the mission briefing began. The aircraft would not fly directly to Vasilivka. It would take off from Kulbakino, head 60 kilometers west, follow the Dnipro waterway bend northward, then turn 35 kilometers east to approach the bridge along the exact west-southwest axis. The MiG-29 would release the bombs in glide mode at a range of 22 kilometers, then sharply turn left and return to the Mikolaev airspace, entering a low-altitude tunnel hidden from radar. This zigzag maneuver was necessary due to the medium-altitude corridor established by Russian Buk M2 and Tor batteries near Karachokrak. The standoff distance was set at 22 kilometers. This is because the JDAM ER glide wings achieved the best lift-to-drag ratio at a 40-degree nose-up angle. The MiG-29 only needs a short climb of 3 to 4 G to achieve this. To simplify navigation tracking along the zigzag route, since there was no electronic officer in the second seat, the pilot's shoulder camera continuously transmitted flight data to be added to the chain of evidence for the mission. This recording would be sent to a UK-based analysis laboratory the following day, where it would be verified that the bomb's ballistic parameters matched the simulation exactly. The MiG-29 assigned to destroy the bridge in Vasilivka, Zaporizhia, entered a runway rollout at the runway threshold, and the afterburner did not engage. 
This was because an economical flight path was preferred over aggressive maneuvers. Finally, the MiG-29 drew a guideline on the western bank of the Dnipro Loop. At this altitude, the ground surface is lost in the noise of the terrain by most radars. This low-profile flight, which cannot be considered radar invisibility, actually manipulated the Russian defense line's field of view. A fast target flying at low altitude matches the tour operator's training perception of a possible cruise missile. Therefore, at first glance, they look for a missile rather than an aircraft. This cognitive bias was a factor that increased the early warning error. There is no laser receiver on the aircraft fuselage, and the GPS antenna is located on the upper tail. Since the antenna is located under a transparent fiber radome, the device communicates without any loss of elevation. When the flight computer sent the final navigation position to the bombs at a distance of 24 kilometers from the target, the PWR arm indicator on the HUD began to flash. This indicated that the MiG-29 pilot was preparing to arm the dual bombs. JDAM ERs perform INS corrections with RNP 0.14 accuracy using localized software thanks to the new tail module. The target coordinates are entered while still on the ground and can be updated in flight if necessary using the in-flight uplink mode. Since the fixed bridge was to be destroyed in this mission, there was no risk of straight-line coordinate error. The pilot banked left at an altitude of 700 meters with a 9-degree bank, then pitched the nose up. The speed dropped from 0.82 Mach to 0.72 Mach. When the vertical symbol appeared in the HUD frame, the release frame probably appeared. Now, with a one-second delay, it was time to release the JDAM ER on the left station. When the JDAM was released, small acceleration sensors confirmed the wing deployment sequence. This sensor data was wirelessly transmitted to the maintenance line in Odessa. The sensor detects control deviations caused by bomb malfunctions early on and enables corrective measures to be taken during subsequent assembly. The JDAM ER is normally a version of a general purpose bomb with an MK-83 body to which a GPS INS kit has been added. But the ER suffix stands for standoff wing kit. This transforms the conventional freefall bomb into a gliding munition with a range of 25 to 30 kilometers. The carbon elastomer wings of the wing kit remain folded while attached to the station. They open automatically when the bomb is released. The moment the bomb separated from the body, the carbon wings opened like a spring. The folded drag brakes turned into a glider surface within seconds, and the bomb nosed down in the sixth second of a 40-degree climb. The small rocket-propelled unit embedded in the tail remained horizontal for 12 seconds, and the glider missile hybrid reached a cruise speed of approximately 0.84 Mach. In response, the MiG-29 performed a 45-degree split S maneuver, diving downward, and when the radio altitude dropped to 90 meters, the bridge had already exited the aircraft's radar coverage. The JDAM ERs, guided by GPS and inertial systems, traveled exactly 22 kilometers. The upper surface of the bridge was visible at 25 meters, and the target was a point 0.4 meters south of the center of the concrete arch. The trigger missile was in delayed air X mode, meaning that the bomb would penetrate the roof panels and explode when it reached the main girder. To maximize the destructive effect of the dam, the ammunition was set to a girder embedding profile. In this tactic, the explosive penetrates the pressure zone rather than the concrete pull zone, so that the crack is structural rather than partial. Explosives experts predicted that this method would render the bridge irreparable. First, the first bomb gave off a flash as sharp as the sound of steel striking steel. Half a second later, the second bomb hit almost the same spot, but two meters to the left. The second explosion tore the bridge arch, which had been weakened by the first, from its roots. The Shark 2 observation drone captured images from 300 feet above, showing the concrete deck broken in the center, debris falling into the water, and the road platform collapsing in a V-shape on both sides. In the first images after the explosion, the bridge decks were split into three, and the middle section had become a pile of scrap metal blocking the river from side to side. After losing the bridge, the Russian 31st Airborne Army, as expected, could not find the radar trace of the MiG-29 that had captured the book. Since the JDAM ER glider attack was a standoff, the aircraft did not fly over the target. The Book M2's 9S36 multifunction radar did not even detect the bomb as a small RCS target. The only signal seen on the radar was the first four seconds of the MiG-29's climb, but by the time the fire was ready, the aircraft had dived into the blind spot with a split S maneuver. Short-range 9M31 air-to-air missiles would remain mounted on the wingtips for mission safety. 
Although the air combat risk analysis was low, an unexpected intervention by Russian Su-30SM cap pairs patrolling the Chernomorka airspace remained a possibility. It was time for the jet to return. The destruction of the bridge and a safe return would be possible thanks to the simple but effective features of the 45-year-old MiG-29. The MiG-29 is a jet with two Klimov RD-33 turbofans, capable of reaching a maximum speed of approximately 2,400 km per hour, or around Mach 2. Additionally, the MiG-29 has an operational radius of 800 to 900 km with full fuel and a two-ton bomb load, and can reach an altitude of 18,000 meters. Its electronic infrastructure is based on Soviet design heritage. Compared to the F-16, the MiG-29's oxygen generator is analog-based. However, pilots have modernized the cockpit cooling system to prevent HUD screen glare even at minus 40 degrees Celsius stratospheric temperatures. This enables precise weapon use without the need for a Western-made helmet-mounted sight. Ukrainian maintenance teams have recently enhanced internal capabilities by integrating Western-style GPS rings, digital maps, and basic Link-16 compatible data links into the cockpit display unit. The cockpit features a single transparent HUD panel and two side multifunction displays, providing a modern analog digital hybrid interface. During JDAM missions, the pilot only needs to monitor the bomb release distance, deviation estimate, and weapon arming status on the HUD. They are not overwhelmed by complex menu layers. All these features enable the MiG-29 to launch JDAM ER bombs with maximum effectiveness. This lack of confusion, speed, and capability enabled the JDAM ER bombs to blow up the bridge and ensure a safe return. The MiG-29 reached a speed of 0.9 Mach at an altitude of 90 meters during target separation, but the afterburner was still off. Upon reaching the western bank of the Dnipro, it climbed to an altitude of 250 meters. During the landing at Kulbakino, the radar panel showed no threat signals. The Buck M2 battery likely issued a delayed fire order after the bridge was destroyed, causing the missiles to lock onto empty air. The MiG-29 touched down on the runway, the brake parachute deployed, and the total flight duration was recorded as 23 minutes. 11 minutes of the 23-minute mission duration were spent in a radar blind zone. The operation was successfully completed. The bridge was completely destroyed by JDAM bombs dropped from the MiG-29s. Following this mission, Ukrainian command allocated the JDAM ER stockpile for critical transition depot strike missions, limiting daily use to a maximum of four sets. In addition to the MiG-29, the adaptation process began for the F-16s that had been added to the inventory. Since JDAM integration is natural in the F-16's digital system, no pre-flight wiring is required. Thus, the plan could be set to move to a larger glider set that would extend the JDAM ER range to over 40 kilometers in the future. The bridge striking tactic would be part of the cut and choke method. The lesson learned from the mission was as follows. Modern GPS guided glide bombs transform old jet fuselages into frontline strike vehicles. Thus, while the takeoff launch process described in the first message had a concrete impact on the logistics chain, in the second phase, the Russian side's repair capacity and supply architecture were temporarily paralyzed. This scenario demonstrated the existence of a similar threat for all land routes parallel to the Black Sea. It also demonstrated that relatively low-cost precision munitions like the JDAM ER can produce strategic results on the battlefield. Considering all this, the July 7, 2025 sortie of two JDAM ERs and a MiG-29 lasting 23 minutes created a gap in Russia's summer logistics plan that would last more than 10 days. On the other hand, this operation undoubtedly had severe effects on the Russians as well. With the bridge destroyed, fuel shortages began, and BTR-82A armored personnel carriers could not refuel to support the infantry advancing forward. The Ukrainian 47th and 65th mechanized brigades noticed this gap and turned their reconnaissance units into suppressive fire. Thus, the destruction of the bridge directly caused the ground front line to remain static for a day. Russian command immediately deployed a mobile air defense line consisting of Tor M2, Pantsir S1, and Buk M2, systems around Karachokrak. But because the MiG-29's gliding attack was carried out at standoff range, the Tor's 15-kilometer range, the Pantsir's 20-kilometer range, and the Buck's 45-kilometer range were not enough to track the bomb. In addition, the JDAM ER, with its small RCS inside a metal body, looked like a bird sitting in a shelter on radar. 
The TOR radar locks onto targets with a radar cross-section of 0.01 square meters or larger, but even though the JDAM ER had an RCS of around 0.015 square meters, the glider's trajectory caused a sharp shift in the radar's line of sight, causing the signal to be overwhelmed by noise. Following this incident, the Russian side planned to deploy Pantsir SM systems at critical road junctions. This is because the SM radar has higher resolution, but its inventory was limited. Defense analysts estimate that the number of Pantsir SMs will only reach 18 by the end of 2025, while Russia needs to provide protection for at least 90 critical bridges. This imbalance is described as the patchwork vest syndrome in air defense strategy. In short, the Ukrainian Air Force, by equipping its MiG-29 jets with JDAM bombs, not only destroyed the bridge in Vasilivka, but also severed the Russian Army's supply line in Zaporizhia. Additionally, the effects of the MiG-29 fighter jets and JDAM bombs have begun to take center stage on the front lines with this latest operation. Thank you for watching.